Greetings and welcome. My name is Mike Bankhead. I am your host. I am a bass player and songwriter from the Jam City, Dayton, Ohio. And oh, this is a special one today. Have you ever wanted to learn how to play an instrument? But either you took lessons before and they didn't work, or you haven't had the time? Well, you'll definitely want to listen to this very special episode of... The You Could Be My Aramis podcast. I am talking to Yue Deng Wu, who is co-founder of a startup who wants to help people more effectively learn how to play music. And she's a musician herself, so if you already know how to play music, you will definitely enjoy this conversation. Let's get to it. All right, we have both hit the record button, and I have already lost some very brilliant things that you said because we were just talking before we hit record like we were friends and colleagues and stuff uh hello ua hi thanks for having me on i want you to tell me stories uh and tell the listener stories as long as you feel okay telling them let's start by having you introduce yourself yeah of course i'm ua i am a former lawyer a musician based in san francisco and now more recently a startup founder uh, I am building a company called Space Notes. We are focused on getting people the best online music learning experience possible. It sounds like you've had a lot of practice uh, with your elevator pitch because that was really polished. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's part of the startup journey, and um, I was really terrible in the beginning. And uh, over time, you get better at it because every time you, it's really just about failing forward. <laughs> You're like, that didn't land, this didn't, uh, that was too long, and over time, uh, you learn to, um, it's not unlike improv in music, I think. You fail forward. So you're a musician. What kind yeah. of musician are you? What species of musician might you be? Um, I, my roots are in classical. On my in the more recent years, I've started to expand beyond classical, but really, I'm I'm a classical musician. For how long? For oh man, um, twenty six plus years now. And which instrument? See, I know these things. I'm just trying to get you to tell right. the audience these things. Yeah, I'm twenty six uh, plus years now. I am predominantly a pianist. I do write my own music. Um, and uh, I also, you know, on a, in terms of other instruments that I could reasonably play and not hurt anyone's ears, I can, we can count cello. Um, <laughs> but really, that is the standard. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, I'm a pianist, uh, a pianist and composer. That's pretty cool. I, as you know, wish I was a much better pianist than I currently am. What got you, why, why did you choose piano? That's interesting. Uh, I don't know that I chose piano because I was four and it was 90s in China. And um, at that time, it was just, there was a, all the other kids were learning piano. Um, it was the thing that parents put kids in. I went to other people's houses and it looked like a fun toy and my parents took that as, oh, she has interest. Um, and also because of, you know, they grew up in an era where they didn't have any of those things available to them. And so I think their generation was very much excited that their kids could do these kinds of things. And so there came the piano lessons. And it, I was one of those kids where, like, it stuck, basically. And as I've gotten older, it was the right instrument just by accident because i um i did learn cello growing up as a second instrument and till this day like i love the cello i love the sound like if you play the cello like i will come to your concerts and listen to you and i love everything about it i don't love playing it the way that i love playing piano though when did piano go from something that you have to do to something you love do you i should first ask if you remember when that happened and if you do can you, can you tell me about it? I don't think it was ever a thing I had to do. My mother was very smart. So and this is part of like her parenting thing that I think is um, she, she saw her friends have older kids and she saw that 
right? This practice thing is not fun for the parent and not fun for the kids. And she was like, all right, I don't, I, I, no point in my life do I want to be managing. Um, you don't want to practice and having that discussion. And so the, 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 we had, we had a deal going into this thing at four, which was, oh, you really want to do this. Okay. Well, I don't know. Like the piano is kind of expensive and then you, you have to practice and then other kids are going to be outside playing, but then you have to practice. Do you really want to do this? This is my mother. <laughs> um, and every time I was like, yeah, 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 I can do this. She's like, oh, are you sure? And so this kind of went on for a bit. And then we saw some pianos. I got really excited. And then finally she says, okay, we're going to do it. But you remember you wanted this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so when you want to go outside and play and when there's even so like when sometimes at night, right, it's after school, you're practicing, your parents watching TV in the other room. I also want to watch TV. Your job, your responsibility, you wanted this, you, you knew. You, you, so this, there was, of course, you're, you're six, seven years old. Sometimes you don't want to be sitting at the piano. Um, but I think I liked it enough that I was okay. Like I, there were, there was crying involved, but it was like, okay, today I had a bad day at the piano crying, not, I hate this thing. I never want to come back crying. But I will say, I will say I became, it, it was just a thing that I did. I was at any other kid learning piano. Right. And I, when I came to the U S I had two really great teachers. So one from elementary school to middle school. And then the one in high school is somebody that, uh, the most influential teacher in my life, um, I believe until this day. Um, and is also, you know, helping me think through a lot of the things with the startup and, um, I'm my, the music education I got was not just about music, but a lot of life skills that brought that I took forward with me um, as in the years that I explored other things. And it was very helpful. While we're, while you're still thinking about your childhood, what was the first song or a musical piece since you're a classical musician that you can remember hearing in your entire life? <sighs> as far I back as you can remember. It wasn't a classical song, so I there was a period of time, and I don't remember any of these songs, but apparently there was a period, my first music, informal music education was um, karaoke is really big in, in China, and then my, we, I think my parents did it at home at that time, and apparently around two or three, my aunt was saying that I knew more lyrics to pop songs, popular songs, than she did. And I was just singing all the time. And then my favorite activity activity was to turn the radio on and just kind of like tap along and dance to it. And then, you know, and then I, my dad had to negotiate with me because he also wanted to watch soccer. And so there was, <laughs> um, and so, you know, um, but apparently that was the, uh, that was the very beginning. So it was probably some 90s song that I can't remember in this moment um, in from china what did your childhood smell like oh my mother's cooking my mother cooks like Please elaborate is, in great detail yeah. yeah so um you know we came to the u.s in 99 um so i was uh, well now i'm yeah i was eight years old at the time and at that time it's not like today where i think you can go to supermarkets and there's a lot of even like asian you know condiments and all those things in the regular supermarket no um it was if you live near like a ranch 99 where a dedicated like asian supermarket like you could get those things there weren't as many asian restaurants everywhere and so my mom i think was always a decent cook but this forced her to make calls back home to my grandfather who uh who was a local chef actually her father and give her a lot of his recipes and it's like complex stuff like bao which is right oh, uh, man, making her own hot sauce <laughs> there was like this whole thing of we come from citron so citron is known for their peppers and um she when people went back to china they would bring some of the peppers back for her and she would make her own hot sauce um and she still does till this day the the chinese uh 
during this time, we do like dried meats and sausages that she makes, and she learned to make those from scratch. The sticky rice wrapped up in the leaves when you go to dim sum, she learned those, and in addition to like so many other things. And uh, she's my mother is very creative with the food, so she in recent years starts to combine things um, in interesting ways um, herself and never really follow a recipe. But her dad just tells, like my grandfather just told her, here are the ingredients you, I mean, the Chinese recipe recipe thing is not like you put a cup here it's not it's like oh you put some salt there's some soy sauce and do a taste test if it doesn't taste salty enough put more um kind of thing and and uh growing up you know there she put a lot of time into um, putting an, meals on the table but cooking every day but also like diversity of food in the house like every meal was different because i think it's also like my mother's not able to eat the same thing meal after meal <laughs> so i think i benefited from that um and so uh smell of hot sauce and um warm soup and all those kinds of things is what i think of when i think of childhood See, now I want to meet your mom. <laughs> Come to California. We'll host you. Cause she I, loves hosting people. Awesome. Well, the next time I'm out there, I'm totally doing that. I love yeah. Chinese food. And where I live, I can't get the real, actual, authentic thing. Obviously, we have Chinese restaurants because they are everywhere. But it's filtered through the American taste bud set, right? Mm -hmm. And ha having been to China just once and having loved everything I ate there, yeah, I, that sounds wonderful. We're very, yes, it's uh, the, the authentic places are more common. When I say that, you see more of it in the coastal cities, um, yeah. both coasts. And um, it wasn't even that way in the 90s. Like, yes, you could find things, but it was very specific. Like, you had to be in the Bay Area, but if you were in Davis, California, which is right where we were, which is, you know, a bit more east, then your options were much more limited. And then LA has another hub, right? And cities right directly east of LA is another hub, New York, obviously. But you, so during that time, it was like very, the, the there was, um, we would drive during the weekend to like a Chinese supermarket that was 30 minutes or 40 minutes away to get some of the ingredients that um, she wanted for her cooking. So you remember what it's like to move across an ocean or more. Mm -hmm. And when you first arrived, uh, you didn't speak English. So we have one thing in common that both of us have, have learned other languages. However, you, you acquired your next language a lot better than I have because my accent still creeps through when I speak Spanish or French, and it always will because I didn't learn them until I was a teenager and I was not in an immersive situation. Whereas I don't hear much of an accent uh, from you at all when you speak English, which really shows how much you've absorbed it. Do you remember what it was like struggling to learn a new language and fit in with a new culture? I'm just curious as to what that might have felt like. You know, I think one of the things I'm really liking these days is there's more Asian representation in media and all those things. Um, that was not the case when I was growing up. And so a lot of things I experienced I thought was a me problem, not like a not a cultural thing. And I didn't understand until I was like in my 20s and in more recent years, some things were as um, that it dawned on me that it was like a cultural difference. But as a kid, I was very adaptable. Like as a, like, it, I just kind of was like, okay, we're here now. I, I was not, I don't know if, it probably part personality and maybe definitely part parenting too. I was just very like, okay, it's a new thing. I didn't feel which was an issue at first because i wasn't i was like oh i'm fine i can like communicate kind of with other kids and when you're like eight like you don't need that much language to play together in the playground or something there were also enough of a chinese community around that like i could find kids that kind of spoke chinese like even though they grew up here maybe it's not as good but they understood me and then we could figure it out from there but yeah i think 
I, I remember it. I remember first day on the playground, not during recess, being like, I, I guess I really don't understand what's going on here. I remember like not understanding, like thinking like sit through like eight hours of class and just like watching the clock because you're like, I don't know what's going on. Like, this is not interesting because I not that I don't know if it's interesting if you could understand, but I assume it's more interesting when you can understand what the teachers say. There was there was definitely and there was a point in time where Chinese is an interesting language in the sense that it's so different um, and it's very hard to learn, very easy for kids to forget. Um, and so there was a period of time where I kind of forgot some of the Chinese, but my English wasn't good enough. And that was a fun period for my mom where like, she just can't really, I just neither language works for her right now. But, and then at some point English became actually the primary. And now my English is definitely better than the Chinese because I'm not super fluent um, where I don't read super well in Chinese, for example. Like you could write me text messages. I could write you text messages back. You send me an article and I'm like, give me like a hot second to figure that out, right? Yeah. So there was, I remember that being a switch. You are kind of behind in academics a little bit for the first few years because the math stuff is okay, right? It's math is math, but the English language, writing, reading, you're just behind. And that one is, you know, for a kid can be really, really challenging um, because you're like, am I not very smart or is this the language problem um, and you don't know because it's not like you've learned the similar things in another, another language before because you're only like 10 so you have no point of reference you managed to overcome that because you're a lawyer how does one go from being a lawyer to being a musician because as much education <laughs> and work as law takes there had to be a point in time where you were not doing a lot of music and now you're doing music again yeah um you know i i it's 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 wild actually i think even to me i think i haven't fully yeah i haven't totally fully registered that this transition happened i never thought that music would be a central part of my career that was not even on my radar um but what i did do which was very strange i was talking to my former piano teacher just two nights ago and i said he gave me some advice that was not meant for like what i took it as it was during that time in high school right we were um, i was performing a lot i was learning a lot of repertoire all classical uh, i was gaining a lot in terms of technique um and looking back, like I, I was telling him, I was like, I didn't realize how big of a jump it was until I started teaching myself. And I realized like, holy crud, we made like massive jumps very quickly, especially in that first year that I was with him. But he gave me advice. He said, you should always have two or three pieces that you can bring up and be performance ready in about a week or two. And that was advice that he was giving me because I was performing a lot and I was, but for some reason, for some unknown reason, that was the piece of advice I held on to. And so through all the years, you know, like, yeah, I picked up cello at some point, I played in some community orchestras, but anytime I was near a piano, and so this is usually, um, if I spent a extended period of time at my parents' house, for example, during summers where, Right, I didn't actually have a piano with me in, in, in all the years I was in LA. And any chance I had, I revisited the repertoire. I kept the fingers warm, basically. And at some point, I realized I wanted to explore more. So I started exploring other genres and uh, exploring composition on my own. And so I basically kept learning. Um, and I had, and in my, I, my thought was like, oh, this is just like my hobby and my a thing that I do, maybe it's a super hobby. And so that's what made this transition possible was when it was time, I was like, actually, I think, A, if it's music education, I've been thinking about this for the last decade because I kept reflecting on my own experiences. And as I was discovering new things, I was like, I wish I was introduced to this at that time. I wish I would, so many things, right? Um, and I was like, well, actually, this is a problem I've been thinking about for about a decade. So if we're building technology on top of that, yeah, I think perhaps like 
I'm not a, I'm, I'm perhaps, you know, at least competent enough to bring this to life. So let's talk about the startup, which is how I met you on Polywork. I saw you were looking for, I guess you would call it beta testers or guinea pig yeah. students. And yep, basically. not only am I interested in being a better piano player, I really believe in the concept of what your company is doing. And I just kind of wanted to jump in and help because I think it's brilliant and exciting. So how are you going to revolutionize music education, Huey? One step at a time is the answer. <laughs> um, so I want to talk more about like the long-term vision stuff because I, you know, the model that we have, I think also is interesting and we should definitely talk about it. And it was the result. It seems so simple at the end of the day, but it took us a lot of time and energy of understanding the market, understanding where music education is to come up with it and to even have this idea. But the basic idea is that we want to the my basic idea on the music education side and just in terms of curriculum is um, I'm thinking really hard about bringing some of the elements that I felt like I missed basically and make it more a packaged um, curriculum for people in which we're building a strong foundation in music. It, we integrate um, more like songs that they know and love and listen to. And so it's relevant. And we kind of get people to explore a little bit more, especially in the beginning, like, and to get their foot into hands dirty, into creating, um, into improv, into uh, playing, of course, technique. You're, you see a lot of the classical influence, I'm sure, uh, as you go through the curriculum, there's no, of course. Um, and that is from my own experience and talking to others where I'm like, it'd be really good to integrate those things alongside um, things like playing and music theory because composition is music theory with application, right? And those should go hand in hand. And that coupled with, you know, we're thinking about where we are right now with online music education, right? And we're generally, we've defaulted to once a week live lessons, whether in person or online. And then otherwise you have a the other side of the spectrum, which is you're just doing it by yourself, right? It's either a video course or it's like a, it, or it's an app and the apps are great for getting you started, I think, but there's kind of a gap in the middle. And um, what we found is maybe there's a way to think about best of both worlds. We think the music and the human interaction with music, I think is, ir I think is irreplaceable. And I think most musicians would agree with me on that. It's not controversial, but I think there are some helpful things that technology can provide, especially in terms of flexibility, in terms of there are things like, you know, like you can be very, you can think very um, creatively about and implement and have people even maybe in the future do activities and things like that through the app experience that's more delightful than maybe reading a music theory book. And so those are the kinds of things on our minds. Um, and so we created kind of, we're trying to figure out what is kind of, can you, we get both elements into one package so that we right with, we really make sure people are making progress. I am really, really thinking hard. Like I do not want anyone stuck somewhere for a long period of time. So I always tell everyone, like, if you are stuck, just ping me and we will talk about it and I will do whatever to just get you out of that. We want to make sure they um, also are understanding. Um, we're focused on adults right now. And adults are very, very curious, um, intellectually curious, and at least, you know, all these users that we have. Um, so we want to make sure that they're understanding what's going on. And it's not just, oh, you put your hand here and you put your hand here and we're just regurgitating something. And uh, yeah, so those are kind of my philosophies, my take, my reason. And for the company is just, I believe that we haven't leveraged technology enough to help us learn, um, whether in music or in something else. And I also think there's a better way to partner teachers, human, the human with the technology when it comes to learning. What does success look like to you for this project? That's a, um, 
That's interesting. <laughs> um, I, I think I, it's just I there's you know the short term like we just right going through the fundraising process and making sure all right like getting the everything ready for that and making sure that that happens and we have a successful raise that's very short term the fact that i get to do this is already a success for me um right like it is a very hard thing to do the thing that you want to do because for two reasons and i heard this there's a there's a this is not an original idea i heard it on a, there's a wonderful podcast by called founders and i believe i heard it on one of those episodes and what really resonated is for me is like there's a lot of one you have to realize what it is you want to do and to realize that is not a small amount of work it is really hard to figure that out and two you have to be able to actually do it and there's a lot of constraints some people have i mean a lot of them are monetary constraints right and i and time and obligations to family and visas right and so it is a place of great privilege that i'm able to do this in the first place um and this is, you know, we work hard so that we get to choose and get more choices. And I've worked tremendously hard and this was my choice. Well, that's inspirational. When did Space Notes get started? It was something that Vlad and I had been talking about, um, but not in any serious way. And then I, at work, what kind of spurred it is, uh, kind of like spurred my thinking about the next step in my career. I, I think it's a healthy thing to do regardless. Like after maybe a year at a place, even if you're happy and not looking, I think it's good to start thinking about where do you want to go next? What are the things you, in your current role, you want to do to set yourself up for success? And in my situation, uh, my boss was retiring. And so I, um, in that time, I really started to think like, what do I want to do next and all those things. And um, I, and it was around that time that we also had this idea that uh, Vlad was actually trying to learn piano. And I was working, I was a lot. And also, I think that he's probably more effective learning with someone um, that is not his partner. So I, um, I I said so he was getting frustrated and um we were starting to have conversations about why and it was because he was uh ha you know I was like why not get a teacher and we started having all these discussions and then we had a friend who was also trying to learn and he was having some similar similar struggles as Vlad um and we started then to think I started then to think oh like I had no really, I'm not, I'm not from the startup world. I have clients that are startups. I had clients that are massive companies in the tech space, but it's very different than when you, you're not thinking about the nuances of how they built the company when you're serving them as a lawyer. And then that really began. It was born out of our own sort of um, frustrations, I think. Necessity is the mother of invention. It rings yep. true to this day. Yep. And I continue to, like, even the last few days, uh, last week and every day, basically, I talk to somebody who basically is confirming a lot of our own understandings of the problems um, and the hurdles. And that's been really, that's been really nice for us to see. So, yeah, it was born out of our own you know, on one hand, you had a person that was trying to learn. On the other hand, you had a person that had been thinking about how she wished her experience was slightly different. Even so, I had amazing teachers and things like that. It was not that. It was just like, well, why don't school teach things like writing music instead of, you know, because right now most schools still offer band, orchestra, and choir. When I say band, I'm not talking the guitar and the drums thing. I'm talking the concert band. Or, you a know, marching, or a marching band. Or a marching band. Marching band, concert band, maybe jazz. And 
that's not that those are wonderful things but you could imagine maybe why kids are not relating to it because it doesn't totally they're not it doesn't connect the dots for them in some ways i think some teachers try with movie music with a lot of things and yeah with space notes you know all goes well we would like to expand beyond just piano right now we're just focused on piano focus on beginner piano we want to do one thing really well first but eventually we want to cover fun things like music production for example let's get back to the things you said that you wished or that you said that you noticed were missing from your own education other than composition which I don't know that is taught in this country until you get to university, to be honest, yes. if you're at a special school. But other than composition, what else did you think was missing from your obviously extensive and successful music education? I would have liked somebody to give me a menu of options at like middle school level, maybe. Maybe when you're a kid, it's you're too young. Um, but even then, I, I still do improv with the young kids. I still do all those things. But, you know, when you're eight and I try to, like, put you on Logic Pro, maybe for some kids that works, for others, it's they it does the conception of it. I don't, you know, their technological skills are also limited. But I would like to, you know, for some of my students, what I did was, like, here's a menu of options. Here's all the ways music can be and all the things you can explore in music, right? You can continue learning to play. You can go down and learn the rabbit hole of learning synthesizers. You can learn music production. You can learn Right, like you can be a person that tinkers with a lot of different instruments and then be a composer, right? That's um, these are all the different ways and in, in genres. Like, what genre of music do you like? No one had that conversation with me. I, you know, in the classical world, it was you get the songs selection is very much like does it push your, your technique in some way um you get some like if you totally hated a song i think but I, I was a very compliant kid so if you handed me something i was going to do it and i i am very broad in my music taste so i there wasn't really anything that was totally wh horrible to me i have very broad music taste but i should have been listening to jazz i should have been listening to Hey, this is Mike in post-production, and this was a very inopportune time for us to have some internet connectivity issues. So some of this conversation dropped, and I'm sorry and about that. And that was something that, I didn't do for myself good. until, I think, post-high school. This is, this is the part that I find fascinating. How old were you when you got around to writing your first composition? Oh, man. Because it wasn't when you were, like, a teenager, probably. Or I tried, I think, without success. And then I didn't really start until, like, I would say in the recent, I don't know, two years or something. So this is the part that I, about music, that I find fascinating. Because we both do different kinds of music, but in some ways, we've learned enough about it that we can talk about it and understand what each other is talking about. But your first attempt at composition, which you were not pushed to do, this is something that came from within you right? You're like, I need to express myself to create. Why do you think it didn't work the first time? Because it's not like you didn't have a clear understanding of music theory and how the pieces function together. Because you can't play piano that long and not have internalized that. I didn't create something that I thought... One is I didn't think that I could, which is a big... This is a big part of doing something. You have to first believe that you can. And if you can, and I just was, it was not, I was a kid. I created some melody, but then I didn't have the perception of, I didn't have the tools to think through it and then think, okay, how does it build into a song and all those things. Um, and as an adult, I've developed those kind of critical thinking problem solving tools. And how do you put whole pieces together? And my education was very like, was not focused on helping me, teaching me to be creative. And so I think creativity is something that takes practice and it's really about noticing is the first thing. And it was something that I just sort of discovered on my own as an adult and just didn't have it as a kid. 
And at that time, I was also doing so much music to begin with. I think it was a time issue to sit down and have the brain space to dedicate to doing something because it, it's a different it's, you know, learning a music is hard and um, learning to play is hard and time consuming, but so is writing. And especially when you don't have experience. And I think I was always like, yeah, like I'm not able to maybe write something that's listenable so maybe that's because there is a perception right because it's not taught into a university yep. people who do it are majoring in it you think oh this is some advanced thing maybe that i don't get to do until later is one or that it's a special thing like i did have friends who were doing it on their own and i was like oh well like that person's very talented and that's just not an area that i'm talented so i'll just stick to you know the thing that i basically am kind of being trained to do because I seem to be okay at that. This is why I will always love music and never get bored of it is because it is so broad and deep and the way that different cultures and educators approach it differs. So I'm mentally contrasting your experience with that of someone who grew up here, bought a guitar when they were 19, Right, learned how to play A major, C major, D major, any minor, and then immediately wrote like 30 songs, whether they were good or not. But like from the second they picked it up and learned four chords, they were writing songs. Which I mean, that's honestly. I mean, a lot of songs are four chords. A right? lot. Heck, a and lot of them are four chords. A lot of them are two or three, right? Right. There's um, also two or three where there's like, oh, that's just a one and a five for like a whole like exactly. two minutes, right? So, uh, this, so the, um, my my point is, there are people that are much much less accomplished musicians than you with different technical skill, but because their approach was different from either their surroundings or the education they received. Mm-hmm. What they got, what they got out of music, what they're doing with that skill set is completely different. They might be comfortable writing songs, but if you hand them a musical score, they'll be like, "What are these hieroglyphics?" And yeah. but this is why I believe in your chorus is that it should appeal to people from both of those perspectives. Should it not? That is the that is. Uh... That's the intent, right? Um, and I also believe, like, I did onboard someone who's like, I don't have a creative bone in my body. I'm like, you don't know that. Have, if you have not tried, right? So I said, okay, maybe maybe that, you know, isn't the part of music that resonates with you and you're really into, you know, uh, you don't feel the need to create your own, maybe. Um, and that's fine. But my job is to give you that option. And my job is to t- give you the tasting menu so that you and and have you at least do a taste test and say, OK, and then maybe the first one, if we're not sure, then we do another one. And because sometimes these things, it's not that the first interaction, like for me, was not great, but maybe you down the road, you try again and it's different. And so that's the approach that we're we're taking. Um, and there are people that come in and they already have a, quite a bit of experience in music, someone like you. And and then when you tell me things, then I say, OK, then we go down that path because that that's right for us. For the two of us, we're solving something for you, which is just getting a little bit more fluency in terms of the technique. And I'm happy to do that, of course. But for those that, you know, haven't done all the work that you have done in the exploration and is completely new to them, I'm like, my job is to give you a nice tour. Um, And we need to do that tour because you've not, you don't know what you haven't seen. You can't have an opinion about the thing that you haven't experienced. When you sit down to compose, because I'm assuming that you compose seated, unless you have a stand up piano. No, I, I, I I do. I use the, the nor that you see when I am recording lessons. What is, what is your, I'm just curious as to what your composition time uh, looks like. I feel like I need to change this question. So I usually ask songwriters, when you sit down to write, what's the first tool you reach for? Mm-hmm. Because that's sometimes that's my voice notes on my phone where I sing. Sometimes right. it's a journal. Sometimes it's a, like you'll get all kind of different answers. But you're the first classical person I've ever had. So when it's composition time, what does that look like for you? I don't even know if I could ask you what the first tool is because you're a pianist. That's what you do. You're probably already at the piano. I'm at the gonna, piano. When you're going to compose. So you don't even have to reach for a new tool. But yeah, walk me through, if, if you have the words for it, walk me through the process when, when you're like, I'm going to compose something today. 
Oh, it's so different. Sometimes it starts from a mel. It just starts from different places. Sometimes it came out of improv. I'm not good at um, if I know something's recording. I I'm not able to create. Oh, that's so red light syndrome. We all know that. What? There's a term for that. Red light syndrome. Yeah, so I, I have that problem. Um, and so I know that theoretically you could p plug, especially with the capabilities that I have with that in that wonderful instrument that I have, you could plug it even into Logic um, and it will record, like you can even record the MIDI and then you can play with it afterwards. I have a very um, non-tech, very t solution to that. I basically... It mirrors exactly how I write it normally. I'm like a, I wrote this sentence, I go to the next sentence. Maybe I, I do have a, I have an overarching story maybe in mind, some points I want to make, just like how I would normally write any, like in English language. And then it's about seeing what fits together. And and I piece by piece, I, I, I do it and then I write it down um, on a software basically. Uh, like a notation software and then i um with the sheet music and it's very rough right um and then i continue and then i get to something i like that works and then i write a little more and we just keep going um it's not fancy it's not revolutionary at all but it works for me no two people ever answer that kind of question the same which is why i like asking it Mm -hmm. So, hey, for the folks listening, have you ever wanted to learn how to play an instrument? Well, at the moment, piano, uh, because that's where Space Notes is starting. They would love to help you do that. What's the best way for someone to join the mission there at Space Notes and then jump in? If you've always wanted to learn piano or if you've been learning by yourself, especially those of you that are early on the journey, um, Go to Space Notes, exactly what it sounds like Space Notes, one word, dot app, A-P-P, and you can sign up there, and I will be in touch. Excellent. So before we stop the recording, UA, is there anything else uh, from you folks that I should promote or anything about you personally that we should promote? No, not at all. I, I, I was just come check out Space Notes. Yeah, and thanks for having me here. And definitely check out Space Notes, and thank you for taking the time. I know that it's got to be crazy when you're trying to start a new company and get it going. So I really enjoy your enthusiasm and dedication to this idea, and I believe in what you guys are doing, and I, I wish that you are successful. Thank you so much, and I'm so glad that you found us and are willing to come along for this journey. Xie Xie Ni, and thank you very much to Yue Deng Wu for taking time out of her crazy schedule trying to manage this startup, Space Notes. Uh, I really appreciate her talking to me today. If you can't tell, I'm very enthusiastic about what her and Vlad are building. I believe in their project and their vision, and I wish them nothing but success. Definitely check out spacenotes.app if you'd like to get on the bus. And hey, I have a special treat for you. Normally I take you out with this music that is, you know, one of my songs, but I'll take you out today with something that UA composed. This is called Finding the Way Back. Thank you for listening and enjoy.